Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Everybody Eats Podcast with your host, Bensky Belazare. We got a call host here. What's good, y'all? What's good? What's good? What's good? And we have a very special guest today. We got Miss Love from Culture Cafe, or sorry, Culture Vegan. Sorry, Culture Vegan Cafe. Um, so before we, we start, uh, for everybody following us on all social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you know we're on there. So make sure uh, you're tuning in. We have some great episodes uh, that we just finished recording, some great episodes coming up. So make sure you guys are tuning in. All right. On that note, um, we love to start the episodes on how we met our guests. So, Miss Love, um, we met it through, uh, or for those listening, we met through Carl Hale. Uh, you guys know uh, Carl Hale from Ginger Hale. He's been yeah. It's good as hell, right? <laughs> so we've had him on our podcast. Um, at this point, it was last year. Time flies. So um, we have a great relationship with him. Uh, he put us on. He was like, yo, you got to reach out. You got to reach out. They got a great story. So we reached out to Love and he agreed to be on the podcast. So here we are uh, this evening. So make sure you guys are networking. Networking leads you to a lot of things. All right. So again, now that we're finished with that, if you can introduce yourself, who you are, what do you offer you? Um, uh, we'll get the conversation rolling. Cool. I'm Love. I'm originally from Seattle. Um, I own Culture Vegan Joint. Re- we used to be Culture Coffee and Tea Bar, rebranded as Culture Vegan Joint. Okay. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have a passion for people and networking. Um, I just became a consultant, apparently, which is oh. nice. <laughs> Um, just got my first official tour that was that was or min- mentee rather so um I have different hats and some I didn't go after but it's kind of cool um I have been vegan for five years and okay. um, it's a journey and um definitely as a African-American woman um, learning my body, learning my background, all of that good stuff. Um, it's been a really beautiful journey of business and in building community, which is what I do. I build communities. So. Definitely. So uh, I have two questions. Um, you said you're a consultant specifically for what exactly? Business. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you meant like, you know, just like, you know, culture cafe, you know, you out here like spreading the, the good word, <laughs> helping, helping build more. Okay, yeah, that's that's dope. That's dope. Um, word. So how has it just, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, um, no, I mean, consulting, obviously, that, that's something, uh, I guess, in the past, I, I've been interested in. I think there's like different folks forms of consulting you have like yeah you know you think like consulting firms marketing and yeah business. like marketing consulting but then even just like helping other people out like yeah. the simple like small business consulting right it's just it could be simple as like hey like you know somebody with a small business and you can help them out um you know with whatever idea that they have and like going forward and have with a different point um but i'm interested in how did you start where did you start before how did how what is the background behind that you said you've been vegan for five years so how is that journey between being vegan and opening up your own joint like what, what's that story like and, and i guess to piggyback off this question my second question is um you said um after you mentioned going vegan you said you know learning your body so how did going vegan help you help you know understand and learn your body better i know that was a lot yeah all right question was how did i get started right so i always had the vision that i wanted to own my own cafe it started out like, i've always loved new soul music like Ever since I was a like, yay high, I've been a body you know, like roots, freaking common, like all of like all of the classic um neo soul artists and um conscious rappers, conscious music have always been about that life ever since I was like a kid, right? And so I always wanted to own my own neo soul joint, kind of like a speakeasy style 
where you know you got like the people you know you know spitting at the front and then you got the person in the back painting the whole vibe you know I always wanted that and so um over time it just morphed and I remember being 18 and saying oh I want to own my own cafe like that's gonna happen and so it just kind of morphed over time where um I started to really get into coffee. I mean, I've been drinking coffee since I was young, you know. Um, I say 10 normally, but younger than that for sure. Wow. Um, but so I've always been into coffee and all that. So it, it was kind of something magic that I used to do with my family. But then it morphed into coffee shops and traveling and visiting different local coffee shops. And then Seattle, you know, it's the coffee capital of the country. And so Starbucks is everywhere. Seattle coffee is everywhere. And so I didn't necessarily have an appreciation for local coffee shops until I left Seattle. And mm-hmm. when I moved out of there, I was like, oh, show me the, the close Starbucks, right? Take me there. And then I started gradually just moving to finding little local shops. Um, so I just got, you know, got super into that. So the way that culture started is I had a catering business with a partner. And um, once I was like, I, I'm not into the restaurant business. Like, I really want just cafe. I want something that I can socialize in and I can enjoy. Like, long hours, all like late nights, all that just isn't, isn't my cup of tea. You know, I like to socialize. I like to really just enjoy my work. And so once I... Um, cut ties with the catering company, I was like, all right, well, let me just go ahead and build this business plan for this coffee shop, you know? Um, and then it just more from there, I got the opportunity to open my first spot, which was, um, which was really an incubator space. Like, um, it was tiny and we just grew from there. I thought you right, I met Carl. Um, we just grew from there and I started hosting this art of coffee and tea expo that just grew every year as well. Um, and last year, this year where we had, um, I think close to 1500 attendees, it was a lot of, and so we just grew from there and then the pandemic happened. And once the pandemic happened, I'm not about to nickel and dime this pandemic we had to shut down and recalibrate so we shut down recalibrate and and then this just fell into our lap this opportunity to open this new this new spot and that was really where ideas started to come to the forefront and you know i was really able to create the vibe and um and really focus on building the culture Post pandemic, or well, I mean, technically, we're still in the pandemic. So, uh, during the pandemic, you found an opportunity. Are you saying that you had a so? Are you saying that you had a shop, then what it closed, and then you opened a new one? Okay, yeah. So, maybe I jumped ahead a little bit. Okay, so yes, in 2018, I had a, um, a 300 square foot space fell into my lap. Okay, <laughs> um. And I worked, I worked with that for two years. For okay. two years, I worked with that. And then the pandemic hit and business slowed down in the beginning. And I was already at that point where I was like, all right, it's time to grow anyway, but I'm not going to grow in, in, um, in a pandemic yeah. this, I'm not going to grow in a pandemic this way. I'm going to take yeah. a break. I'm going to focus on some inner work, do some inner, some personal work, recalibrate business, and then restart. Got it. So I love that because uh, you hear a lot about the pandemic. I know early on we were talking about, you know, people taking advantage of, you know, like working through it, people taking advantage. Um, But we were mainly, or at least myself, I was mainly talking about people with like online businesses, right? We knew that like public businesses, so to speak, or like in-person businesses, like stores, a lot of them took a hit. But it's great to see that like, yeah, like you may have had to stop for a little bit, but like it wasn't the end. It was just like a brief pause, you know what I'm saying? And then you were able to come back. So that, that's great to see, especially like small businesses. We know those small ones took, took a bigger hit um, for in-person, things like that. Like to make, well, I mean, uh, on a positive note of the pandemic, I, I think it's pretty cool seeing the creativity a lot of businesses and business owners have exhibited um, during the whole situation. So I think it's pretty, 
Yeah, for sure. So I'm curious, actually, when did when was the move from Seattle to to, to Virginia? Was that like when you were younger? Or was that like more recent when you were opening up the shop? Uh, I'm 2013, so oh. I've been here for like seven years. Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. So what was wait? I have to answer the other part I was just of the about question. To get to it. One more. <laughs> oh, true, true, true. There was a second uh, question. I remember that. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, how did going? You said. Um, You've been vegan for five years now. So how, I guess, going vegan straight up, I, I don't know, or maybe, like, how did that how did that uh, impact, like, was that transition hard? And on top of that, during your, your uh, initial journey, how did you get more in tune and uh, like, like learn understand more. your body? Yeah. Or learn more. Yeah, there you go. I think with any like I guess with any lifestyle or habitual ways that we've acquired whether it's through family ties or habits that we've created just over our lives um with anything it has to do with the strength of your mind and how much you want it right and so coming into veganism wasn't it it was for me it was a it was my own journey and so I didn't really allow the the term veganism to dictate um to dictate my diet necessarily it was just more so of a goal so when i say i became vegan i was still eating fish when i felt like my body needed to i would still Mm. eat you know things that i felt like okay look i have to move into this slowly but surely right and so i just i just um i just adjusted accordingly but with the goal in mind and cutting things out along the way. Yeah. And so I think it was just the, it was just the um, identifying with the vegan lifestyle that came first and then progressing toward it. And sometimes, and, and understanding that it's not going to happen immediately. Yeah. It's going to be something that, that is happening over time. It's just like a filtration system, you know? You never get all the metals, all the particles out of the water, you know, but you gotta filtrate it a few times to get those yeah, things, yeah. you know? You gotta find the right filtration system to get all of those things out. So, you know, it's it's um, it's really like unraveling your DNA and unraveling all that you know and relearning. And so that was really that journey And so when I say I, you know, I um, have, I, I've identified with the vegan lifestyle for five years. uh, That's what I mean. I had to learn my body. I had to learn. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't go cold Turkey because then it's like, it's like, you think about um, when someone's in rehab, right. And you have to inject them with the, with the thing that, that, that ultimately started the addiction but then if you insert them back into the environment that the addiction initially started with started in, yeah. then they over then they have a high chance of overdosing. Yeah. So it's the gradual steps that you take to release these, you know, to release these um these habitual ways that we have in, in, in the lifestyles that you know, and sugar is an addiction and carbs are an addiction. So all food is an addiction. Yeah. And so I just had to, I just had to you know, keep inserting what I was used to into, into the, into the, into my lifestyle, but still cutting it out at the same time. And that's how I learned my body. Um, and there's, and it goes a little deeper than that even too, because, um, I had to learn the ways of my ancestors Mm. and, um, I have to learn what my blood and what my DNA was made up of because, I, I don't believe that, I believe that, for example, European people who can eat meat closer to being raw, right? It's like, you go to a black person's house and you're like, well done, please. <laughs> I'm good with that, right? But then you have people who literally just slap it on the grill, boom, boom, done. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But the thing is, is there are also people in the black bloodline who who can take it that way. And there are people in the white bloodline that can take it that way and, you know, so on and so forth. And so that just means that 
your body has an ancestral um, background, a, 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 an ancestral diet that you should learn so that you can you can fit your lifestyle to that diet and then unravel it and then start to cut it out um, because, you know, that's important to um it's important to know the way your ancestors ate so that you can start to make adjustments to um to the disease that that you keep bringing into the generations to come if that no, made sense i hope that no yeah it does yeah you're talking about like you know on, on learning certain things or slowly like weeding out certain things and i've been like uh you know i i, I went shopping earlier today um and I told them, I'm going to get candy today. And then I went, saw the candy, didn't get the candy. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the little things, you know, it starts small. Um, I guess I, I didn't get ice cream either. So I guess that counts. <laughs> I really love ice cream and I wanted candy because it was Halloween. So I didn't get either. So I guess that's a, it's like a point on the board in terms of like, I'm learning everything. So I, I get that, yeah. No, nah, definitely. Um, it, it makes me think of um, kind of like you said, like whatever diseases, right? You think of as in the black community. I, my family is from Haiti, right? So you know, we have like a certain diet that you know Haitians love to eat their rice. Haitians love to eat their you know fried pork, their griot, so to speak, right? Um, and you know, you, you think about you know, there are a lot of certain diseases, high blood pressure, right? Diabetes, diabetes. those things like run in the family. Those are generational. You know that a lot of a lot of time that attributes. Yeah, high cholesterol. A lot of time that contributes to the diet um, or what they're eating, you know. So um, I think that that kind of touches on there when, when you said trying to, you know, understanding your and, you know, kind of like your ancestral diet, you know, what are they eating? And then, you know, trying to, you know, understanding your body, what, what works for you and, um, you know, how to, how to live a healthier lifestyle. I think on top of that, it's also like, uh, uh, maybe I wouldn't say maybe finding the modern day replacement or, um, version of what they ate because I, I heard not heard but I um yeah actually I, I heard that uh, you know a lot of people you know we can't afford to eat um as black people we can't afford to eat things like pork rinds or real unhealthy parts of meat or 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 food in general because our ancestors were you know they were working the fields they were doing they were doing like 16 hours of labor to burn that off you know now in this day and age most people are working a nine to five or, you know, um, whatever, eight, eight, a four to eight hour shift you're working, then you can't go home and eat, you know, the, the fatty white part of the break, bacon you throw out or <laughs> the, you know, pork rind from the vending machine, you're just, you know, take that uh, chicken fat. And <laughs> <laughs> we can't afford to do that because our bodies aren't going to process it, you know, as efficiently as we would if we were, you know, yeah. very, very active. Well, and our ancestors who ate those foods and then went to work in the fields, that wasn't their natural diet to begin with anyway. Yeah, that was usually what was left over. That yeah, was exactly, that was left yeah. Over, you yeah. know, it wasn't even right. like, yeah. That was forced on us. Yeah, and yeah. So then it was carried into the bloodline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. So um, I kind of want to say that a little, little, continue this conversation a little bit in the last segment when we talk a little bit more about health. But this is, this is some right. really good stuff. <laughs> this is definitely some really good stuff. Moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's just that's a little like appetizer for you, but um, definitely I definitely want to save that. Gotta bleep that all out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for sure. Um, but I guess more about uh, toward, towards the business, I'm I'm curious, right? You hear a lot of times um, people say, or I guess like statistically, like oh, restaurants are like one of the most common small businesses, and they're usually like one of the uh, top ones to to like fail or something like that. Um, but I know you say yours is not a restaurant; yours is a cafe. Um, so I'm interested, what kind of challenges, because I, everything has challenges. So I, so I guess, like, what challenges did you face uh, starting your first shop? You know, like, what is that like? I've never had, you know, a small business, let alone, you know, um, you know, a, a joint or a cafe, you know, just like hosting people and food. So I guess, like, what were some of the, you know, biggest challenges either in the first one and then definitely in the second one, because the second one, you know, this modern one, it wasn't done a pandemic. So I know that was a whole different story in itself. So if you could kind of speak about like, what were some of the biggest challenges that you had to face doing that? So the first, the first spot, the thing I had to focus a lot on, cause I was, I was definitely, I was younger. 
I was going through some spiritual, you know, some spiritual transformations along with some personal transformations. Um, and so my biggest um, learning curve in, in the beginning was leadership. Mm. So in order to really drive this business forward, I have to have the proper leadership qualities. And so um, I would like, I would listen to like early in the morning, the butt crack of dawn before anybody got there, I would go in, I would prep food and, you know, just listen to podcasts. I would listen to like brain food podcasts, um, things that build my confidence to, to um, things that helped me really, you know, figure out who I was. And um, I think, I think, I think that was the beginning part of my business. And so moving into this new spot during this pandemic, my challenge now is, okay, so I managed a team of two and a half, two, three, you know, at the last spot. So now I need a bigger team. And now I have to step out of my comfort zone with more people, more delegating, more, more creating, more, um, more systems, building more systems, building more processes, um, streamlining my, you know, streamlining my, uh, or um, sorry, scaling my business and trusting it with people yeah. on a larger scale. And now also putting myself out there a little bit more because now that we're bigger, the potential for people to just kind of discover us is a lot higher. Yeah. And so, um, you know, now, you know, so the challenges before were who, who am I, who am I becoming and where's my business going? Where do I want it to go? How, how much do I want this to survive? Where, where, what does this look like? What does the future of culture look like? Um, and then money, money was, was always an issue. Right. Um, because I needed to I needed to either make it or give the illusion that I'm making it. Mm -hmm. So it was one of the one of the two. Right. And one of them, you know, so the illusion of making it would give me the potential that I could either get investors or get money, you know, get get financed or something. Right. And then actually making it meant that people come through and I could cut corners and somehow save enough so yeah. that I can grow. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, because yes, the more money, more problems, the more taxes you got to pay, the yeah. more, you know, um, the, uh, the more people looking at you and they're checking you out to see, okay, what's going on over here. So those were my challenges is which way do I want to go? Am I focused on the money? Or am I focused on the illusion of making it so I can grow? And that was that was huge. Um, and so I focused on the illusion of making it. Because if I focused on keeping it and saving it, my business wasn't going to grow. I wasn't going to be able to show it on paper that my business has the potential. And so when the pandemic hit, um, I just latched on to as many resources as I could based on what I had already built. And it just worked out in my benefit because um, the person who I acquired the business from, um, who I acquired this space from, um, she already knew my work ethic. She already knew um, the potential of the business. And she was just like, all right, I'm going to help you out. And I want you to grow. I want, I want your business to survive and thrive. And that, you know, I got through that challenge. I got through that obstacle of trying to prove that my business was worth it, was worth the growth. So, um, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, one thing that you said, uh, you said that one of the first things that you learned in the, in the, in the first shop was leadership. Um, I'm interested, I guess, how we did an episode on leadership two, three weeks ago, um, pour into leadership. So I'm, I'm curious, like how, you know, what did you learn through that? You said every day you listen to podcasts, you have a team, of like two or three people that you have to, you know, like delegate and do tasks with. So I guess like, what did you learn about yourself? How did you develop leadership skills? And I guess like, what was the importance of leadership 
skills in that. And how do you eventually, like you said, trust them with the business? So how did that, you know, I'm sure it took that one took a long time, but how did you know, all of those come about? So um, I, so what I learned, okay, hold on. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, playing play back. I, I, I do it. Back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I guess, like, what did you learn about either yourself, you know, when you said that you have to learn leadership quality? Yeah. I guess we'll start with that first. Yeah. So what I learned about myself was that I'm a control freak. Mm. And I can micromanage the hell out of people and nitpick <laughs> and you know, hey, oh, you need to put a little bit extra on there, okay? We got, and it was just a lot of, it was a in in my mind, it was a lot of grooming other people, right? Yeah. And so once, um, and and also feeling like I always have to be at the rescue of my business, mm -hmm. and you know. If a if a, an employee made a mistake, it was detrimental to my business. I have to stop letting they can't make mistakes. Stop, <laughs> right? So just just always like on their asses about hey, make sure the customers you know make sure they're getting this kind of experience. Make you know make sure you're you're um you're giving it like this or you know, and what it was doing was. Even though they were loyal, my my employees that I had there were like, they, and they still are with me now. They're loyal, and they love culture. And so, and so, I think that they they took that because they knew my heart and they knew my intentions. But ultimately, I was putting them in a position where they were always going to need me mm. because they were afraid to make decisions without me because mm. they were afraid of any consequences that could come with it based on what I was who I was when I was working around, when they, when they were working around me. Sound like Gordon and so, <laughs> huh? Sound like Gordon Ramsay out here. <laughs> Go ahead and tag him. <laughs> Go ahead and tag him. So, so, um, so ultimately what that does is in a, in a, in a in the grand scheme, right? Let's say let's say I was doing that all the time right now at the at the growth rate we're at right now where I don't have I my employees don't necessarily have to be loyal to me. It's not tight knit. It's it's more of us. So they're getting less of me, right? Because because now they're all having together in different facets. Imagine me doing that with every single person right now. I would bring down the morale of the business. Mm. Um, they wouldn't. They wouldn't feel confident in their in their work. And so again, the work falls on me now because everything that they do, they have to come to me for. Yeah. And so the biggest thing I'm learning right now is in leadership is micromanaging my business. And not doing it, um, not doing it so much. Giving giving my employees space to make mistakes, um, and really giving. And, and what I do when I'm doing that is, I'm each time I'm a step closer to walking out the door, so that my business can run itself and I can continue to work on the business. Yeah. Um, and also, um, it helps it, it, it get. Um, it's okay that I don't have all the qualities of a leader. Um, it's okay to hire people that have those qualities that I don't have. It's all right, you know? Like if I'm not that great at delegating, but I, I've hired someone who has those leadership qualities and they can delegate, it's all right. A great leader is okay with, with understanding that they're not gonna be great at everything yeah. and so really not being insecure or competing with my employees mm. in their positions because at the end of the day i want them to be leaders i want them to be able to to hold their own um and i'm not in competition to be in leadership with them i'm the pioneer i've done the work 
And now if I put them in positions where they're confident to run this business, they're going to run it like their own. Got it. That's that's deep. That makes nah, sense. she. I think that's the most in depth. Yeah. <laughs> honest. I, I, everything she said to me really like ties into the the quote of the day we're gonna get into later. But I really like. I, that's that's dope. It's like it's a real. It's um. It's a more um, personal take on leadership. I'd say it's not a generic. Like we actually get to hear. I I like you know you're talking. I'm sitting there imagining everything going on. So like I I, I really. I guess appreciate that answer, honestly. Yeah, for sure. It makes me think of a couple of weeks back, we had um, one of our faculty advisors back from undergrad, uh, Professor Miller, and she said, like, pretty much, essentially, like, a leader, a leader's job is to pretty much, like, help. A leader is supposed to lose their job, essentially, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're supposed to work so someone can come replace you. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, what that makes me think, that, you know, you, you're building trust in your employees and letting them make mistakes and letting them run. So eventually you can get to that point where it's like, you know, maybe, you know, say you have two or three more shops and you can't be at every single one. You know, you have, you know, people who can run the shops for you and you don't personally, physically have to be there, you know, doing all that. So I think that, that's a definitely a great, great answer. Um, and, and, oh, yeah. Also, um, recognizing the skill set in people. Mm. So you can place them in positions that they're going to, that they're going to bang out and do yeah. well at, um, and where they're going to be comfortable, yeah. so that they have power over that space enough to the point where they're confident, and then you're confident. Yeah. Um. Because the biggest, the, the number one thing I could say is you just got to have confidence in your systems, so that the employees don't so your systems replace you really is what it is um and that's that's the important part of where 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 i'm at in leadership is can i can i can i provide systems enough for them to where they know exactly what to do because sure. it's, it's all up here yeah wait no say it again can you couldn't hear that yeah can you say that one more time Is she on mute? No, she's not. I just can't hear her. It went quiet. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. So yeah, could you repeat that last that last From thing like you said? Up here and yeah. like, after that, it, <laughs> it was, was getting real good. Yeah. <laughs> I said my systems are up here. Yeah. But um, so my systems are up here. So now I just have to translate them to my employees so that they can now run it because my systems replace me. Gotcha. You, gotcha. You, gotcha. You. So, um, on one last note, before we go to the, uh, the quote of the day, um, we love to ask this question, uh, cause we got to ask one time is what is your conceited goal? Right. So when I mean that is what is that in regards to culture? Like, what is that one goal, one thing that you want? And not I want to grow the business because everyone says I want to grow the business. Right. But what is that one thing that you want to achieve, Let's accomplish? Selfish. Yeah. Like Let's that one selfish baby. goal that you want, that you just want to do, achieve or see. For myself or for my business? Oh, business. 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 For your business. business. Yeah. So culture is not just a name it is a way of life every person who walks through our door holds an individual unique perspective culture rituals they do things they they do things they they bring things to the table that they can share with other people creative abilities all that stuff and we want to focus on the unique individual and so Selfishly, I want to be that space. Culture needs to be that space in 757 that actually embodies our name. It is when you come in there, you see a random person in the corner drumming mm. or you're eating your food or you're having coffee with your friend and there's just a belly dancer hanging around. Or, you know, we sell paint canvases where you can come in on a regular day 
and you grab your coffee and you say, I need some therapy. Can I get a paint canvas? So we want to grow into a social cafe space that is really embodying our name and that is culture. We are bringing out the uniqueness in people that they didn't see in themselves. And so it's a safe space. Got it. Ah, that's beautiful. I goes back to the yeah. quote we had before. Titles ain't shit if the story don't match it. And Miss Love out here <laughs> is making sure her story matches the name Culture Cafe. I, I, I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So hey, we're gonna have to I'm definitely gonna have to come pay a visit. Definitely gonna have to come pay a visit. So, um, on that note, segment two, everybody eats podcast. We got the quote of the day. Let's hear it. Oh, so real quick, you'll say the quote. We'll try and guess who said the oh, quote. Oh, you guys aren't guessing this. Uh, <laughs> you guys aren't guessing this. I guess you're not guessing. <laughs> we're just gonna, we just uh, give like a, um, a brief rundown of what it means, our, our interpretation of it. Um, okay, so uh, the quote is, there are things known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. By Aldous Huxley. Hmm. Can you tell me what talking? Uh, there are things known and there are things unknown. And in between, there are the doors of perception. Hmm. That's deep. Yeah. So, I mean, personally, I, yeah. I see it as um, if, if, uh, for visual purposes, there's like a spectrum and, um, you know, uh, known and unknown right here. So you start from here to there. And of course, everybody's journey is different. So I guess the doors in um in this analogy kind of represent maybe the little hash marks you would put on each end of the spectrum before on, on the on the spectrum before you get to the other end or if you can ever get to the other end and um of course we all digest information differently we all perceive things differently so um my my line with the little hashes in it might have more or less doors or a different it's definitely gonna have a different number of doors than you know, Bensky's or yours. So uh, I guess that's everybody's perception of, of things. You know, and I, I think it varies for everybody too. Um, when I was, when I first read it, I thought it was a real, um, I thought it was a bad quote, I think it's pretty fixed. But uh, I mean, if you really think about it, you have a lot of, you know, there's ignorant people, right? So an ignorant person's line is most likely gonna, be, it's gonna start here and right there, you know, you're gonna see that, you know, but for someone who's probably more open-minded, who's had more experiences, you know, you might not be able to see the other end of their spectrum. So I think that, that's that's my interpretation of it. Where the first thing that kind of came to my head, when you said things on there are things known, things unknown. Um, I guess the first thing that came to my head was like, you know, some things are fact, some things like are, right? So like, blue. yeah, like the sky is blue. Like that's not really like arguable. Um, but at the same time, I guess also so things known, there are things unknown. But at the same time, I guess, you know, when talking about perspective, like two people can look at the same thing and just interpret it completely differently. Right. And it could still be like a fact, like, right, the sky is blue. Like we could both look at that, but maybe like, I don't know, like, you know, it's a certain shade of blue in the morning. It's a certain shade of blue at night or maybe, you know, like that shade of blue and I don't like that shade of blue right so I feel like you know even within I guess the way I, I took it is that like some things are some things are fact but you know everything I guess comes down to perspective you know what I'm saying and um kind of reminds me of a quote where is it it's like um when, you, when the things you look when you change at the, the way you look at things the things you look at change yeah. something like that so I think that kind of like you know comes into my head when I think of that quote so that's my little interpretation. How about yourself? I like both of your guys' perspectives. That's <laughs> really dope. What came to mind for me? Everything, man, like my life revolves so much around like spirituality and understanding of life. And because I'm always a student, my perspective is always open. Um, like right now, it's really hard for me to, to, to dig my feet into politics mm. because I'm so open to information. Mm. Um, you know, I like to sit down with people who are on the seemingly opposing end and really figure out what's going on there, yeah. you know, what's going on in the mind. Um, and so 
Um, I think that the un the known and the unknown is really just being open all the time to new information and to always being a student, to always um, walking into every situation just as a conduit for new for a new experience. Um, so that's kind of what I gather from that is um, the things you know and the things you don't know are almost one and the same because even though you think you know, sometimes you don't always know. Yeah, that's the fact. entire, you know, it's like, it's like um, I was talking about learning our body, right? Our ancestral lineage and all that. Like our molecular, like learning things down to a molecular level. You know what I mean? Like getting down to the science of it. It's like, how are you black with green eyes? Ooh, good question. Let me break it down. Let me get down to the molecular. All right, my grandmother, my dad didn't have them. My mom didn't have them. My grandmother had them, but where she get them from? Yeah. So it's like breaking it down and being open to that information. So now I know this. Yeah. I know that it started somewhere, but I don't know where it's going to go from here. That's true. But yeah. I'm open to knowing where it's going to go from here. Yeah, yeah, So let me go ahead and continue to be open to, to the next information that's going to come through. So. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. So, could you say the quote one more time before we switch to the last segment? So the quote is, there are things known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. By all this Huxley. All this Huxley. There we go. All right. So, for our last segment of today's episode, uh, I want to get into a little bit of a conversation about health, health in the back, Black community. So, we kind of spoke about this um, right briefly earlier, talking about your journey, talking about you know, our, our, our diets and things like that. Um, I guess my question, I guess, starts with the vegan lifestyle. Me personally, right? I'm not, I'm not a vegan. Um, I, I like my burgers, right? I like, I like my chicken. I like my hot dogs and things like that, right? Um, I guess my first question: is How hard was it for you? I don't know. I don't remember if you if you answered that earlier, but I guess how hard is it to, you know? I know you said it was more of. Uh, was a gradual thing, right? So I guess how did that start? Where, where did you with someone? Did you yeah? Did someone introduce it to you? Like, hey, I'm like I'm vegan. Was it something that you kind of like grew up around? So I guess like how did that start and how was that like slowly taking things out? And I just have this is an easy question. I think um I keep adding on to it. <laughs> uh, backtracking. I had vegan food for the first time, uh, maybe. two years ago, I want to say, maybe two years ago, um, and I ate it. I don't think I knew it was vegan food at the time, but I did know later, like later that same day, I felt like I, I want to throw up. Like my body, like I, I could feel something sitting in my stomach and and I just wasn't. I mean, my body rejected it. It knew it wasn't, you know, real meat. Someone told me it was like a, like a meatball or something. I ate like a uh, spaghetti and meatballs and then like, like beans or something. An hour later, someone's like, oh yeah, that thing was vegan. I was like, yo, no wonder my, it felt like a rock was just sitting in there. You know, my body wasn't just, it wasn't, it wasn't doing the thing. So, I mean, it, I don't know if you had an experience like that. I, I personally, like along with events, yeah, I can't do vegan food. But, um, so. So I guess to go back, how was yeah. the journey for you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to summarize, to summarize that. Have you ever had an experience like that? I personally, I never went back. To uh, the transition, I, 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 I touched on it earlier where I said it's your mind, yeah. you know, how strong it's like we have an addiction to food and different kinds of food. And so what, at what point do you want it? Do you want to? switch your perspective on food how bad do you want to do that and what are your goals in it so it was introduced to me um so basically I was dating this guy at the time and he was like 
oh, I don't eat any pork, you know, beef, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm mostly vegetarian. Every now and then I'll eat, um, I'll eat turkey if I get an inclination. So I was like, okay, you know, he was kind of radical. Um, and so I was like, all right, you know, he challenged me to 30 days. I was like, okay, I could do this, you know. So then that happened. Um, I did the 30 days, I think. Mm-hmm. And and then um I started dating this other guy and I ended up challenging him. Mm-hmm. And we did 30 days together. And at the end of that 30 days, and I know I did this 30 days. Okay. At the end of that 30 days, we went and like ate. He was from Philly, so he we ate like Philly cheesesteak and like you know the place off Tidewater Drive, like the real Philly place. I've been trying to, and, to but yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Y'all gonna go to tomorrow, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we ended up going there, and we were like, mm, 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 so good. But the next day it was terrible. Mm. We were sick mm. because our body had detox. Yeah. You know, we didn't have that bacteria in our body that processed the meat anymore. And so we were sick and we were like, all right, you know, I ain't feeling this. Let's go ahead and start transitioning. So we went to pesca, like pesca vegan, pescatarian lifestyle where we were just eating fish. And mm-hmm. then it just kind of, you know, went, you know, we just went through that over the years um, and just kept cutting things down. So there was one point where I only ate fish like once a month, if that. And so um, that was really, I mean, it was just, it was less of like, it was like less of like, a, um, this is, you know, I'm trying to find things to eat. I'm trying, it was more so like, if I can't find anything to eat, I'm going to eat what I want, mm. you know, but if it's something that I can, that like, you know, consciously do, that's going to help me on this journey, I'm going to do it. So, um, yeah, and just replacing products with new products. So, like, if you had an experience with mock meat, um, it was probably too much of something. So maybe too much vital wheat gluten, which isn't really good for the body, isn't 100% good for the body anyway, but it makes a really good texture meat and it has a lot of protein. And so, but, you know, your body may not have reacted to it well. Um, That's not to say that, that's the only thing that's that part of the the vegan lifestyle there's rice and beans i mean we eat a lot of vegan stuff that we don't even realize is vegan so like rice and beans um um eating um a lot of whole food vegetables greens you know salads all those things and there's ways to do these things hearts of palm um jackfruit all yeah. those things can be made into really good 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 dishes yeah um and so there's i mean there's just different ways that we could do it without having to make a mock version of what we're used to eating yeah instead of necessarily trying to like replace what you're eating it's kind of like more of like finding new things um also i guess that that's uh that's part of the journey as well so yeah, yeah. so okay. um I, she did emphasize a lot of new things so yeah, yeah i keep yeah. it up in mind right so i said <laughs> <laughs> so right. hard you know it's so uncomfortable <laughs> yeah but yeah definitely you now i mean it's it's i uh, like you you can start you start off saying it's, it's the it starts with your mind you gotta really and I mean, to be honest, I think it, it, it starts and ends there. It starts and ends there, you know, to an extent, you know, the minute you decide you're not doing this, it's kibbutz. But nah, yeah, definitely I'm, I'm having a, because like I said before, I'm trying to go on a little like, trying to edit my diet a little bit. And it's really, it's just, you wake up and you have a craving, you know, you have a craving and it's really hard to just stop yourself from like going on autopilot and going, you know, you can wake up, and, you know, and go do your routine and you're craving one food. And before you catch yourself, you already you have like three bites in your mouth already. And you're like, ah. <laughs> so, I mean, definitely one thing I'm personally working on. I, I really like your take on everything and and, and um, um, the advice you've given. So I, that's definitely something I'm going to keep, keep with well, me. Well, think about your quote, you know, 
and and venturing it's your perspective so a lot of people have an easy time being healthier because they're not resisting the opportunity to try something new and so i eat a lot of exotic food i don't i don't necessarily prefer american food um i love like indian food like you know all the way latina you know like love the you know love um the latin diet i eat a lot of like um ethiopian food like african foods like i do a lot of different you know variations of diets and since i've opened myself up to those flavors it's like, oh my gosh, the creativity in the kitchen is on a hundred now. Yeah, yeah. That's what makes it more fun. That's what makes it easier to just transition because now you're opening yourself up to more, um, more palates. Yeah. And more restaurants and now more experiences. And so, you know, when I turn people out all the time, when they come eat our food, especially our waffles, our waffles are like our number one hit. When they come and eat our waffles, they're like, I'm trying to go burn Waffle House down. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, and so we make sweet and savory waffles too. So now we're getting real creative with it where yeah. people are like, I never thought I could eat a savory waffle and like it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh my gosh, what, what kind of sorcery is this? <laughs> you know? It's like, we just, you know when you again when you open yourself up and you change your perspective now you can flex any way you want so if you want to eat burger one day and then you just happen to trip up on a good vegan spot and you're like let me try this out you know let me let me go and see what let me test the reviews out let me see people aren't going to lie on the reviews and say it's good if it ain't yeah that's true you know what I'm saying? So, you know, definitely test it out. And, um, you know, I have a, cu a couple of restaurant friends around here and we just, we pass customers back and forth. I'm sure Carl has told you about Desmond's. Ooh. Like me and her, we call the employees back and forth. Like me and her, we be, we be sharing employees, you know, that's how, <laughs> that's how like we are, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we love the hell out of each other's food. And, you know, and so she makes some really creative dishes that yeah. have no mock. You know, I mean, she's out here making, you know, chicken with mushrooms. And I'm like, you got me out here eating chicken? <laughs> I almost put my life on the line. You know what I'm saying? Like, is this chicken? Did you just <laughs> And I had to sit on the phone with a pregnant pause. Like, are you sure you did? <laughs> And so, and so, you know, um, you be surprised at the creativity. Yeah. And then when you open yourself up to that palette, you're not resisting it. And so now you're traveling because think about how many, how many experiences have you had with the food you're used to eating and you're like, damn, this is nasty or this is subpar. Like what's going on with this? And it's like, but why are we so hard on vegan food? Is it because we're not just, we're just not used to eating it yeah. or is it, label that's attached to it like now if i eat vegan food i gotta call myself vegan no you absolutely don't you just have you just open yourself up to the opportunity to enjoy the food yeah. and then you give your body a break from processing um meat which is energy mm. and then you think about the way it's processed anyway because you know and this isn't this isn't to be preachy or anything but yeah. You know, you're giving your body a break from processing another living being's energy. And you're only processing whole food at a point. But either way it goes, you're opening yourself up to more opportunities. To no, definitely, food. definitely. Because I, I kind of want to ask Ness what next. Um, I guess, what would you say are some key tips um, or some advice to someone who wants to start that lifestyle? I know you covered, you know, mental, I guess that would be like the number, the number one you said, um, being like being open, like opening up that palette. Um, so I think you covered a couple parts, but I guess maybe do you have any like last advice or last, you know, suggestion for anyone maybe who's on the fence or thinking about, you know, like starting on something new, on substitute. That's another one. Yeah. So you, you said a couple. Do you have any any more tips for, for anybody? Let's see. Um 
Start with the soul food. Find a soul food vegan joint. So, okay. Yeah. Hey. Oh, that yeah. reminds me. Have you heard of Slutty Vegan in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Look, as soon as I can get Slutty Vegan, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, like I like when I tell you I have had vegan food all across the country. Like, because I'm an avid traveler, I like love I love just going to different places and visiting all the local spots. Yeah. So I've had vegan food everywhere, good food, bad food, you know, mm-hmm. like just everywhere. Even when I went to Cuba, I had to like, okay, what's going on here? Like, I gotta figure it out, you know. But um, but there's this market in florida it's called the yellow green farmer's market and i tell anybody who is traveling and looking for a really good um like vegan options and then they have other options as well but if you just want to go and like pick at the different like array of, of vegan options out there that's the market to do it because it's like so many different options like Ethiopian, you got raw vegan, you got um, freaking soul vegan, like all these different, there's this, um, there's this uh, vegan junkie burger place that they were like, oh yeah, that's about to replace McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like, and it was so bomb. Like the food was amazing. And so you, yeah, like it's just so crazy how, um, how rampant the lifestyle is becoming, you know, um, and how many opportunities it is just to just to switch up your day and have something new on your plate. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, for sure. You, you said something um, earlier, uh, kind of like tying with the lifestyle. I think a lot of times, um, I think like veganism or that vegan diet does have vegan diets does have a certain stigma or like stereotype to it. I think that's why a lot of like certain people shy away. I admit myself too. Like I perpetuated you know, it <laughs> yeah, quite I mean, a many times before. Yeah, like even myself, you know, I I found myself like, oh, that's vegan. Like I'm not gonna try that or I'm not gonna taste that. You know what I'm saying? Um, but my first I, I probably had vegan food or, or like specifically vegan food, right? If you count like vegetables technically as vegan, but I think like a vegan spot. Like I probably had it like a few times, but the first one that I vividly remember was Desmond's. I had that last year. Um, and that was like, that blew my mind. Right. I was like, yo, she had some rasta pasta. She had some meatballs. I think they were like made out of beans, but I could have swore. I was like, this is not vegan. I was like, like, I'll fight somebody on this. Like, this is, this is like, this must be like pork or something. (laughs) Like, like, nah, it's beans. I was like, nah, that's that's ridiculous. Um, (laughs) But it was, it was great. You know what I'm saying? So um, kind of like you said, you're like, just because you have vegan food, does that mean that you're vegan? No, you know what I'm saying? But it kind of like, it opens up your mind to like, oh, there are options, you know what I'm saying? Like, it opens up your mind, it changes your diet, like you said, do something different, you know? So um, I think I think that's a, that's an important uh, important piece to take to take from that. So um, on that note, before you ask for the song, are there any last points before we wrap up today's episode? Any last points you want to either talk about yourself, any advice you want to give, open it up. No, I'm about to go eat myself. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure, all right? So, uh, either of you curious if you had a song that- Any song you've been listening to, uh, repeat, nonstop, anything. You know, my go-to artist is her. Okay. Like, she just speaks to my soul, but but classically, Badu, anything. Okay. I to, yeah, I go to Erica Badu. Um, I also listen to a lot of lo-fi. So I don't actually have like a certain genre of music that I'm attached to, but definitely like lo-fi. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a, that's something to note though, that a part of culture, um, we are building a playlist of local artists so we can only play local um, artists at our shop so if you guys know anybody please refer them to us so we can put them as long as the music is going to fit our vibe we'll play it and we'll shout them out put them in our stories and let people know that this is what we're vibing today Um, and that will also build you know the local culture of music and their confidence in their music knowing that it's being played at a local spot so 100 percent. we actually we had a, a saxophonist on our episode, on our podcast, a couple of months back at this point, his name was Michael Jamil. Um, 
So I think he's definitely fit the vibe. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent he'll fit the vibe. So after this, after this oh, episode, I'll send you, I'll send you his Instagram and all that good stuff. But Michael, he was really good. Okay, yeah, send it to me because we will certainly play him. For sure, for sure. All right. So did you have a specific song though or no? Oh yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, a whole hour. <laughs> okay, okay, I got it. I got it. So it's her. Yeah. And it's um it's um uh, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> yeah. you say, but I hate you on most days. Have me in uh, uh, ancient my page. You know that's on lyrics. <laughs> I, I rather find when you sleep at night. Y'all know that song? Hard Place by her. Yep. There we go. Uh, I feel like blank, look, I've been up since like 5.30 this morning, y'all. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. So we'll make sure we add that to the playlist. Yes, sir. Yes, but sir. On that note, uh, Miss Love, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It was great conversation. Uh, I learned pleasure. a lot. Yeah, definitely a pleasure of ours. I learned a lot. Um, definitely, we're going to have to stop by. Um, I don't think I'm doing anything Saturday, so I'll probably have to swing by on Saturday and get some of those waffles. I, I I really love waffles. I think they're the superior breakfast food over pancakes and French toast. Again, I'll fight anybody on that. So um, I'll, <laughs> try, hey, I'll definitely have to try some of those savory waffles that you got. Um, so um, how can people find you on social media or I guess like in person? How can people find you, um, learn more about culture, visit the shop and all that stuff? Well, they can come see me. We're in Virginia Beach, located at 1309 Fordham Drive, Suite 106, and on Instagram at Culture Vegan, it's spelled C-L-T-R-E-V-G-N, and on Instagram, on Facebook at um, Culture Vegan, so C-L-T-R-E-V-G-N, um, yeah. All right, perfect, sounds good. So anybody listening, make sure uh, you tune into our podcast on all platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, follow us on Instagram, that's everybodyeats.pod, follow us on Twitter at EBE Pod. On Twitter, make sure you're checking out. If you're in the 757 area, make sure you're checking out Culture Vegan. Get yourself some, get yourself some culture, right? So that's what that's what we all about here. So on that note, thank you very much and have a great evening. All right. All right. See you guys later. Thank you. Take care.